And during this Women's History Month and in light of the current state of war in Ukraine, we thought it was important and timely that we have a discussion on war as a public health crisis and the impact that it has on women and children. So I'm honored to moderate and facilitate this discussion. And I'd like to thank Ms. Dawn Skeet Walker and her team in the Office for the Vice President for Communications and Marketing for really organizing and um, bringing this group together. But before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we do recognize that these are difficult times for everyone. And we do have counseling services for students, faculty, and staff. So please use these services if you need to. I'd like to begin our discussion with an introduction from Dr. Gwynn. Dr. Gwynn is our Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff. Dr. Gwynn. Well, good afternoon. I almost said good morning, but good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to you know, bring some greetings from the President's office. Uh, Dr. Riley wanted to be here, certainly, uh, President Riley, but he's literally on two Zoom calls and has someone waiting outside his office. So uh, <laughs> I was drafted. Um, at any rate, you know, this is an important, absolutely important uh, discussion that will take place here, a uh, session that our marketing and our communications and marketing team pulled together uh, in conjunction with the president's office and something that we wholeheartedly endorse. Um, you know, with all that's going on in the world, as Dr. Boone Foster uh, alluded, it's, you know, it's, it's good to be able to at least start such conversations, you know, conversations that are germane to women, you know, particularly during Women's History Month, but also more importantly, conversations that are germane to us in the world, you know, just everything that's going on, COVID, with gas prices, with, with everything going on in the world, it's good that we as professionals, we as, you know, downstate, we as, you know, a collective of downstate, we can have these discussions that start the conversation that helps, you know, that will help at least one person un better understand what's going on in the world, what's going on around us so that we can actually try to, again, just help people. So I, yeah, I'm very appreciative, you know, the president is very appreciative to, you know, communications and marketing, Don Skeet Walker and her team uh, for pulling this together, uh, for Dr. Boudin Foster for hosting it, uh, and all of the panelists who I'm sure you're going to gain extreme, extreme amounts of information. Of information. So again, we are appreciative and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Glenn. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Todd Demisi, who is the Dean of the School of Public Health. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, my great pleasure to be here to join my, with my colleagues to address this important public health issue. At first, I want to thank uh, Ms. Dawn Skeet Walker for bringing this important public health challenge to the, for, the forefront of discussion for hosting the panel as part of a woman's health a Women's History Month event on behalf of Down State Health Science University. As you know, this is a, a timely event considering what we are witnessing in Ukraine. It is unfortunate that state-based conflicts are at a historic high. In 2019, only 54 state-based conflicts were recorded, and this number is a record high since 1946. Women and children were unfortunately disproportionately affected by many aspects of conflict and urban war. And according to the Amnesty International, healthcare facilities in the northern province of Tigray, Ethiopia, where I came originally from, uh, registered about 1,288 cases of gender-based violence from February to April 2021. Young and pregnant women were raped in front of their family uh, members by a group of soldiers. Rape and sexual violence have been used as a weapon of war to inflict lasting physical and psychological damage on women and girls uh, in this part of the country. Uh, in, fa uh, in that conflict, women and children are, are the majority of war refugees who fled into the neighboring countries like the Sudan and Kenya and other uh, 
places, leaving their homes and all their belongings. Many children are also conscripted as child soldiers. The negative consequences of war and conflict not only occurs during the conflict, but it also extends post-conflict uh, period and uh, most affected areas are left with broken health systems, destroyed infrastructures, and shattered economies of a significant mag magnitude. For example, I can tell you my own experience in 1991 when the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea ended, soldiers who were conscripted from many neighborhoods in the country uh, were told to leave all their weapons and go back to their original uh, place of uh, conscription. And during the war, about 25% of the soldiers or the military were infected uh, with HIV. Actually, I am the one who did the survey at that time, taking the blood on, uh, from these military people. Then after the war, when they went back to their neighborhood, they carried this infection and spread the infection throughout the country. A lot of uh, women, pregnant women were infected. Uh, a lot of children also were born uh, with HIV. So this is really, really an important uh, thing and an important public health issue that really needs serious attention. And it is important that the international community, including the UN, should create a system to hold those responsible to make sure that they are accountable for their actions. And, uh, you know, a task force should uh, national, internationally should be established to, to really work on guidelines and action plans to prevent the occurrence of these events uh, in the future. At last, I wanted to thank the panel discussants and the audience for paying attention to this increasing uh, public health concern that merits uh, an urgent attention. Thank you for, uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Dean Demisi. So I'd like to welcome our panelists and start by introducing our panelists. So joining us this afternoon, we have Ms. Stephanie Gasco. Ms. Gasco is a journalist with over 25 years of experience covering war and veterans, politics and policy. She's worked for several major news outlets, including the Associated Press, the New York Post, and the New York Daily News. She's, she's managing editor of Defense One, a division of Atlantic Media, editor of Social and Digital Development and Military Times. In addition, she has um, freelanced many publications for many publications and appeared on several television and radio shows. Um, she's reported in Iraq, Afghanistan, Guantanamo, Haiti, Brussels, as well as reported on the World Trade Center um, on 9-11. She's also created and edited two popular websites, Warzone and The War Report. Welcome, Ms. Gaskin. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Angeliki Papablasopoulos. Dr. Papalosopoulos is the medical director of OBGYN Ambulatory Care Services at Downstate University Hospital. So thank you and welcome to our esteemed panelists. So over the next four minutes, we're going to be sharing a video. And this video is a compilation of several um, video clips that our communications department um, assembled for us. And that will be the basis for launching um, a very intimate and personal discussion. So if we may start our videos, please. With, with this war, we, uh, we saw a lot of cases we did not see before. Most of them, they came from a village where there is no medical care. Some of them, they came with very bad general condition, which may die because they came too much late for treatment. We treat as much as we can, and we hope we will be able to complete doing this. In these seven days, we have uh, already done with uh, 21 babies, 21 deliveries. Some of the deliveries was in, in our shelter, 
but we try to give birth in more clean uh, rooms, in our delivery rooms, in our operating rooms. But uh, if we have uh, a bombing and a siren, we go to the shelter and uh, there is our uh, delivery room with uh, all our staff and all our patients know how to go to shelter. We try uh, in, in the day go to the uh, ward, to the room, and uh, patient take a shower, have a like normal life. But in the evening, it, uh, at 6 p.m., we go to the shelter and stay at night at the shelter. All of us go crazy. It's not something you get used to. War is not so terrible for governments, for they are not wounded or killed like ordinary people. I, I've, I've never thought that. Well, my grandmother told me stories uh, from the Second World War and, uh, you know, I couldn't uh, really feel her words, but now I think I know what it means. You can lose, you can die basically in every moment, yeah. But now we have a responsibility for our son and, uh, yeah, it's much more complicated. This is a country which is now on its knees. and two days, 35 weeks and two days pregnant now. Uh, we went in the countryside where my grandparents are to stay there. We thought that it's going to be a bit more like safe place for us these days. And it wasn't <laughs> because it appeared that uh, kind of the village that we were in, it's next to Vasenkiv. And it, like at that night, uh, the bombing started and I got my contractions uh, going on. So I was uh, advised to take some medicine um, and thanks God it stopped the contractions. Uh, yeah, so and after that we just wait, waited till the morning and went through all the, uh, through all the like empty ghost roads and empty city and got into a clinic that we were uh, like supposed to get into. So. Uh, babies are born, life continues, but it will never be the same as it was before the war. The video allows us to touch upon um, several topics. So this about a year ago, um, the Lancet Journal, Lancet did a four-part series on women and children in conflict settings. And this report I mentioned as Dr. Um, as Dean Demons, he mentioned that in 2016, 17, armed conflict affected at least 630 million women and children globally. And they also stated that over the last 20 year, war, years, warfare has resulted in the death of more than 10 million children under the ages of five and between 6.7 to 7.5 million infants. So this series was published online in January of 2021. And here we are. A little over a year later, a, um, a, a little over a year, we're having this discussion today. So thank you to our panelists. So let's get started. I wanna start with Ms. Gaskin. So you've had um, experience in journalism expert for over 25 years. And we often focus on the atrocities and, and, and despair, which is very real. But what struck me was when one of the um, individuals in the video said, life continues, but it will never be the same. 
And I remember watching images in Ukraine of, of, of people singing the national anthem, as well as one woman who was talking about her interaction with her daughter. And her daughter said, why are you smiling? And she said, I smile so we can live. We stop smiling, we stop living. And that touched my heart because it reminded me of the strength and the resolve. Yeah, seeing. I mean, so, that goes for everyone there. It's not just the women and children. Um, you have to find um, humanity. All, all, everyone has to find some piece of humanity. And, you know, obviously what's happening in Ukraine right now is, is so hard to watch. And I'm, I, I can only speak to like my experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. But uh, one thing that kind of struck me as I was listening to that is, um, you know, we talk a lot about uh, about veterans, right? You know, these veterans come home, these men who are uh, soldiers and they come home and they struggle, right? Mm. Think about what the women and children struggle with as well. You know, it just, these are grown men who are struggling with what has happened, what they've seen, what they've done you know, with, with being shelled or being, uh, having their family killed or not knowing how they're going to get food or whatever. And, and then, you know, you talk about, you know, all of our vets, which are super important and then take that to a different level and think what that does to the women and the children. And that to me has always struck me in a war zone. And, um, like I said, my experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I can talk about that, but I have a lot of um, friends and colleagues who have covered global conflicts across the world. Um, Chris Hondras was one of my best friends. And I remember he, when he covered Liberia and, it, and, and uh, uh, Sierra Leone and, and all these conflicts, this was decades ago. It's the same, it's the same. We know what happens. I don't know how we could stop it or fix it or make it better, but you look at any conflict, even back in the middle ages, it's the women and the children. And uh, it, it, it's not just about the warfare. So I, I saw that firsthand. And if I may, I'll give you a few, a few things that really struck out at me. And I'll, uh, you know, I, I te sometimes I get emotional because it still sticks in my heart so bad. But it, like in Iraq, as a woman, well, as a man, I should say, you couldn't really talk to the women. So all these soldiers or even, you know, all these soldiers, they couldn't really help these women because you weren't allowed to be around them. Um, you know, it's a, it's a cultural thing, right? Um, and so I, as a woman covering a war zone, there's there there are disadvantages and then there are huge advantages covering a war zone as a woman, which when when you look at who's covering this war in a, in Ukraine right now, a lot of women, and women in war zones and I could I could rattle off ten people right off the top of my head who are doing great jobs. Women need to start covering this stuff. The the men were not allowed to go in the kitchen or go in the bedroom or go in the back of the house or anything so i was you know i was embedded but the fellow u.s soldiers i was with could not speak to them so i could go in the kitchen and talk to them and say hey what's going on now yes i had an interpreter because I, I i don't speak arabic but it was allowed and i remember um i remember the story of this one woman and we talked about the war and how serious it was and I said to her, what, what is, what's your biggest problem? Like what, what, what bothers you the most? And you know what she said to me? She said, my kids are driving me crazy because she had to take care of her three or whatever it was children in the middle of a war zone. And she had to feed them and she had to keep them, uh, somehow like just not driving her bonkers and think about in your real life. And I don't have children, uh, I, I, but I love children. Can you imagine taking care of a child in a war zone as opposed to taking care of them, like getting them to the school bus and that's, it's irritating. And, oh my God, they didn't do their homework. And, 
now they have to do this. And now they have, these women, you don't understand how strong they are. They are just so strong. And I, I, re, this sticks to me. And this was in 2007 that she said this to me and it sticks to me every day. She, and we had a good laugh about it. I think it gave her a break because she couldn't complain. But she said to me, because the kids can't play outside, right? They can't play outside. There's bombs. They can't go in the field because there's, you know, uh, IEDs. They can't, you know, the father's gone. They can't, they have to discipline. There are all these things that these women are dealing with in a war zone that you don't, you, you don't even realize how small, but yet how big they are. And it's not just about feeding your child and giving them medicine, but it's like, giving them a spirit so that they're not broken. And one other story that I would really like to mention is um, we were on like a nighttime raid once and, um, you know, they're raiding the houses of like bad guys, right? Oh, you know, and, and of course there's women there, of course there's children there. And um, as we were leaving, this woman had this infant child. I mean, couldn't have been more than six months old. And I have this big water bottle and I gave it to her thinking like, here's some water for you and your child. And one of the soldier, the U S soldiers that was with me said to me, um, kindly, but he said, you, you should, you should think twice about doing that because that's a U.S. water bottle. And when Al Qaeda comes in, they're going to know that we were here and that she had contact with us and that might put her in danger. And that blew my mind. I just wanted to give water to her and her little infant child. And they, and, and he, he was just like, you, these are like corners that you can't see around where you're thinking you're giving a woman water. And then he's like, no, you'd be surprised that they will see that. And they know, you know, they know the markings of the bottle and such. And that, that, that changed that, that I had to like kind of sit and think for a couple of days about how you approach covering a war because you have, you want to tell these stories, but you have to protect them in the same sense. And um, I, I met this wife of a general and she gave me cooking tips and she was cooking for all his soldiers and c keeping them going. And I was just like, how do you do it? You know? I mean, there's just so many little, little, little things that it's not just like the woman showing up with her child, you know, it's, it's the everyday process. If you're getting shelled or if you, if there's IEDs or you don't, you can't walk to the store, right? First of all, the store is closed and it's not safe to walk there. And and, and you just don't know who's the enemy. And there's just so, so, so much to it that these women really, really um, have to navigate that me, I had a hard time na navigating. If I had three kids, I don't know how I would navigate that. And they're all strong. I mean, they're all, they are really all strong. They pr probably would take up arms if they, if, if they didn't have to take care of the children and, and, and those, those statistics that you just gave, um, I bet they're probably double what you just said, to be honest, they really probably are. And you look at Ukraine right now and a lot of the women want to go back. They put their kids in a safe situation somewhere, probably in Poland or with a friend or whoever. And, and, and there's a recent story I just saw today where they all want to go back. And then you can look at like women in combat. I mean, that's uh, people will always, oh, women in combat, <laughs> they'll fight. They'll fight. They'll fight for their kids. They'll fight for their families and they'll fight for their country. And they're strong. They're really, really strong. And they cook and they change diapers and they carry their kids. And I was never more proud to be a woman than, than the times that I was in combat and not and and not just the women but even the so the, the female soldiers as well you know it's like i know this is um international women's month but it should be every month every you know it's just 
and, and it's the same across the globe. It, it's this is you know I, I can speak to my experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it's the same across the globe. And I just thank you so much for for holding this um, really important discussion. And thanks, Dawn. Dawn's a longtime friend of mine, so if she ever calls me and needs something, I, I do it. <laughs> But yeah, God bless all these women and children. And look, the men, the men are good fathers too. You know, this isn't about like, oh, you know, the men, do you think those, these men wouldn't want their kids home and to play with them and do all that, but it just, it's, it's hard, but um, yeah. I mean, you, you really, thank you so much. You really shared a lot of the, the strength and the spirit and, and the resolve um, and, and it's day-to-day -day activities. Right. I the mean, the, the woman saying to me, my kids are driving me crazy sure was in an honest moment. And she was so honest. She was like, if I could just have them out of the house for an hour, you know, and her husband was gone and she didn't know if he was alive or not, but, she, you know, just take a break. And we all sit here and talk about self-care, right? That's a big thing in this country. Like, take care of yourself first. You know, when when you're in a war zone, you don't really have that option. No, you. I mean, this this concept of continuing in, in, in daily activities. I I can imagine how hard it is in times of war. But to we play a game or to, to soften soften something. Yeah, read a book or, or, or just smile. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or smile. Oh, you're right. We. That's a great ending. Just smile. It takes a lot to smile, but you have to. Yeah, and, and we add to that another level of complexity and that's COVID. That is still, we're still in a, so Dr. Dr. Geyer, if you can um, just continue this conversation. Um, in the video, the vision, the um, a physician said, we're seeing lots of cases. We didn't, we're seeing lots of cases we didn't see before. And it's, it, it is a different context that they were discussing. But if, if we think about COVID and the complexity of conflict, war and COVID. Um, as an emergency med medicine physician and the physician who's worked in emergency preparedness, how, how does that complicate um, the current situation? Yeah, look, I, you know, conflict um, in any situation um, is terrible for, for health in general, right? Um, you saw what COVID did. <laughs> we know, we've experienced it all in all of our countries. Um, I'm in Australia, and Australia was closed off for, for almost two years. Um, basic <laughs> things like what we've had to do, all the preventive measures, such as social distancing, um, hygiene measures. How do you do this when you are displacing, you're fighting, uh, you're fighting, you're fighting for your life, you're running away, um, you can't practice hygiene potentially, you can't distance from people, you're running away and you're in overcrowded situations when people are leaving and desperate to get away from fighting with their kids, you're not practicing social distancing, right? And there, Ukraine had um, the highest incidence of cases of COVID in Europe just last February. So it's not nearly over yet for Ukraine. Um, so just basic things that we've we would do and that we've become accustomed to doing for COVID, the population can't do, and it's active. It's very, very active um, in, in um, the Ukraine. The second thing, and this is really, really important, um, is about sort of access to care in general, right? Um, we've seen the lack of respect for international humanitarian law, and this is not solely in the Ukraine, Yemen, Syria, South Sudan, you name it. Um, and I've seen this over the last sort of decade or so increasing. You know, there is no respect for the humanitarian mission um, or med the medical mission. Um, people destroy hospitals. They destroy ambulances. Um, and there's no accountability. And so whilst these spaces used to be sacrosanct, um, they are no longer. And so you have, you know, the hospitals that we need that have already not enough space to treat normal patients uh, when I say normal patients, if you've got heart problem or you have an accident, then you've got COVID. Um, that's all, that's causing a lot of disruption to hospitals already. And now you imagine the conflict. Um, so the access to care is severely dis reduced. Um, but it's not just the destruction, which is already horrendous. Um, 
it's the brain drain. You know, people are leaving because, as Steph was saying, they've got the doctors, the nurses, the midwives, um, the, the cleaners, they've got children, they've got families, they're leaving. And so this is a very common occurrence in, in conflict. Um, a lot of the medical staff uh, leave, but then there are a lot of brave staff that are just sticking out and staying and they are overwhelmed because they, they don't have the support, right, that they need. And, and this is really, really heartbreaking because, you know, I've seen so many um, medical staff who, you know, will continue to come to things that are being shelved and provide care, um, the stresses and the traumas of trying to care for, um, for their patients uh, in active conflict um, is, is really, really horrendous. Uh, and not to mention just the difficulties of providing access to care um, without the third point I was going to make is supplies, right? COVID, we saw um, throughout the COVID situation, and it's still ongoing, is a lack of supplies. You need personal protective equipment. You need oxygen in hospitals. This is being severely curtailed in conflict zones, and particularly Ukraine right now, they're calling it that we can't get supplies into certain areas. We can't, or can't get oxygen in. So what happens if you just have a, you know, a chronic disease like diabetes, and then you've got COVID, you need to go into hospital. You can't even access it because there may be shelling around. Or when you get there, there's not enough supplies. It's, it's really, really heartbreaking. So this access to healthcare is all the more compounded by something like COVID when you already have such dire situation and then you add the conflict on top. So the access is, is, is absolutely important. Um, and we see this, you know, the excess death and excess disease um, and uh, impact on health already caused by conflict. And, you know, my big fear is these sort of things um, uh, I've seen nowadays are going on for not like weeks or months, we've seen the war in Syria, Yemen, South Sudan. They're not week-long, month-long things, right? They are going on for decades. And this completely changes, you know, the impact um, on individuals, families, women, people get, families get broken apart. But on a, coming back to, on, to the health side, we get a disruption of, services that we've provided for years to help a country progress, right? Um, you know, I worked at the WHO, World Health Organization, for many years, and part of the mission is supporting countries to, to move their health forward in a long-term way. Now, that means you put in um, long-term vaccination programs, you put in control of disease programs for things such as, um, so the vaccination for things like measles and polio, um, diseases such as TB, malaria. Now, these programs take years to decrease the, the disease. Now, a conflict like what's going on in Ukraine right now, it's only been a few weeks. We already had polio last year. Vaccination for COVID is only about 35% in the population. It's very poor, right? You disrupt all these programs. So all these diseases and things that you had managed to control come back. And conflict is, is the absolute perfect storm to take you back decades of development in health, right? So we will start to see in, in no uncertain terms um, polio resurging again, you know, in measles resurging again in children, um, uh, TB that already there's a, I think, has, is one of the top 10 countries, Ukraine, in the world for resistant TB. Um, if you don't get your medicines, you don't take them, you get resistant disease, right? Because the supply chain is disrupted. All of this is then again compounded by COVID. Um, and and I, can't, I can't stress enough the, the long-term impacts, the short-term impacts of just you get injured, you're fighting for your life, can't access health services. And then the long-term impacts on children and women in particular, because they really rely on preventive services. Um, antenatal care, uh, vaccination programs. Um, and finally, you know, you need water, you need sanitation. If urban warfare and there's targeting of infrastructure, well, your taps don't run. How, how, do, you, how do you wash your hands? How do you practice, you know, hand hygiene? 
how do you, um, you know, bathe and look after your children as you're running away? There's no water. It's COVID has put such a huge burden, as I've said already, without conflict on many countries. And now you put the conflict in and it's crippling. Thank you so much, Dr. Dyer. And, and that leads us to a discussion you talked about access to care, um, uh, um, fragile infrastructure, stress and trauma, low rates of vaccinations and, 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 and uptake in, in, in um, measles, polio, um, um, resistant TB. So now we add to that um, pregnancy. So Dr. Papadopoulos, um, can you take us through a discussion on, on the complications that, um, that may occur when you, when you have um, people given birth um, in this environment? And, and um, you know, the, the, um, the Landsex series also talks about um, those living in near areas and in intense, with intense conflict have three times the higher mortality rate than those living in comparable or um, more, more peaceful areas or in areas where there's less conflict. So what are some of the, um, the, the, the outcomes that we will see in terms of not only stress, but um, the social determinants that, we're, that, that, um, um, that are combining with infection? What, you know, what, what impact um, would, would we have, would that have on maternal um, outcomes as well as, as, as child outcomes? So, you know, pregnancy is a, is a very sensitive time period for, you know, women in general, right? Um, you know, you're carrying a baby. Some women are also already mothers, so they're thinking about, you know, their other children. So when we're talking about stress, there is so many different things that are going on through a woman's mind. And let's add war. I mean, I can't even imagine what a woman would be going through during, you know, uh, her pregnancy in that scenario. Um, if we want to talk about basic, you know, biology, just like what effects do stress have, uh, you know, on pregnancy? I mean, it's probably endless. We can start with, you know, stress giving you high blood pressure, right? And we know that high blood pressure is not good in pregnancy, can lead to diseases like preeclampsia, which is a pregnancy disease of, you know, high blood pressure can lead to seizures, you know, seizures can lead to trauma, no oxygenation to, you know, your baby and your belly. Um, you know, these are, these are very serious consequences. You know, we see them in every day, you know, or in, every day we see them here in the United States, but, you know, I can't imagine the, the effects that war would have on, on that itself. Um, we also know that I'm sure, you know, with stress, there's also an impact, obviously, on the development of the fetus. So, uh, you know, there could be impact on brain development, you know, future, you know, uh, behavioral, um, you know, uh, consequences. Um, I, Preterm labor is another issue that could occur because, you know, a woman is in a high stress environment, especially in a war zone, right, where she's literally fighting for her life. You know, the other thing that I do see um, with women in general that are stressed, I see that, you um, you know, unfortunately, because uh, we are constantly thinking about everybody else, you know, again, our children, our pregnancy, we kind of neglect ourselves. So there's another big issue to think about there in terms of, you know, your, your, your mental health, right? We, we here are always talking about how, you know, mom's mental health really, really matters. And it will always, you know, it comes first because your outcome of your pregnancy and, you know, the, the future of her, you know, family has a, it's a major impact to have, you know, um, like good mental health. So I know in a war zone that that's probably very, very, very uh, difficult to maintain, uh, despite the fact that women are just so resilient and you see it all day, every day in my, you know, in my practice, uh, you know, in the clinic, and I hear from my colleagues all the time. I mean, women are super, super resilient. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that there is an impact on, you know, what they're living through. Um, you know, we also have to think about other things that stress impacts. Let's say you are lucky enough to find a safe enough space to deliver, you know, your baby with no complications, which we know is, you know, not necessarily a, a guarantee, even in, you know, an environment where you have, you know, full resources, right? I think about even the after effects of that. These women, maybe, like we were saying before, maybe they don't have water, maybe they don't have enough nutrition. How are they going to breastfeed? The stress of even trying to get your, your baby to latch on during, you know, breastfeeding, um, producing milk. And then if, you, if you're not getting enough milk, where do you get the formula? How do you feed your child? So, uh, you know, stress is not a small thing, you know, um, in general, <laughs> 
But for women where they have no outlet, no safe space, I mean, that's, that's difficult. I can't imagine, you know, being in labor and not knowing where to go. And there, there is one more thing, uh, you know, I thought about actually while I was, you know, discussing this is uh, transportation, right? So let's say you're, you're stressed and you have to actually get to a place that may be safe. How do you get there? How do you get there in a war zone? How do you make it, you know? And then you put your hands in people who are hopefully working there, who you know how, know how to deliver a baby. You don't know who's left there, who, who may be able to deliver a baby. And there, there are many complications to a delivery um, that you know not anybody can can do. So um, it's it is a lot. It is absolutely a lot. No, you raised some great points, Dr. Gary. Did you want to add to that? I saw your hands go up. No, no, thank you. Um, you know, in the video there was a an obstetrician gynecologist who said. We treat them by day, mm -hmm. and then after 6 p.m., we go to the bomb shelters, right? So can you imagine um, caring for people in this environment and timing when the deliveries are? Um, and this is, you know, this is such an important conversation to have after observing what happened to the hospital um, and, 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 and women and people being pushed out in, in, stre in stretchers. And, um, yeah. So... Now, you know, you mentioned um, stress. You mentioned stress. So um, Dr. Viswanathan, I can't see you. Are you Dr. Dr. Vis? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Putin Foster. Uh, a special uh, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Don uh, Skeet Walker for really amazing work in putting this uh, uh, excellent panel together. Uh, there are uh, three points uh, I would like to make Mm -hmm. uh, in the health, you know, we talk about uh, primary prevention and secondary prevention. You know, uh, prevention is the most important treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, an important aspect of uh, uh, preventing wars, as well as a number of other social evils, is uh, we have to elect more women leaders. And if we do that, I think a lot of uh, <laughs> these uh, problems we are discussing today will be solved. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, uh, more than uh, 10 years ago, I had the privilege of uh, listening to uh, President uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, she was a Harvard uh, commencement speaker, mm -hmm. and I was just uh, 15 feet away from her. Mm -hmm. And it was a really one of the most memorable experiences I had. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, Ms. Johnson Sirleaf was the first woman to be elected leader of any African nation. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main thing, you know, which is more important, and that is what she did before becoming uh, president. Uh, as all of you know, Liberia had uh, years of uh, civil war, and there were child uh, soldiers. Uh, people were committing atrocities against their own uh, people. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, Ms. Sirleaf, Johnson Sirleaf did was uh, she organized all the women in Liberia, you know, because she realized all the soldiers, they had mothers. And hopefully, uh, even in the worst of circumstances, mothers have more influence. And uh, so she, uh, the main thing is the women needed to be organized. She organized them. And uh, so they, uh, as a united front, they persuaded the men to lay down their arms and come to peace talks. And actually, when the rivaling factions met, uh, they surrounded the parliament building, uh, all the women. Uh, so they said, you know, the men couldn't exit till they laid down their arms. So this is a remarkable, you know, achievement, right? It's a, in a, it was also very risky, you know, because the women could have easily been killed. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, this for this work, she was subsequently awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And the important things to note here is uh, uh, organizing women, you know, women have power. Uh, but it has to be recognized and organized. The other thing is the nonviolent means by which you know she achieved this in a country which was uh, at that time you know, very prone to violence. And there are other examples of you know women leaders uh, you know uh, uh, which who are very, you know usually women are more uh, 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 conflict resolution prone as opposed to straight away going to arms. So that's important. Uh, the second uh, important thing in terms of uh, prevention is uh, capacity building. Uh, Dr. Demisi is uh, well uh, aware of it. You know, like uh, we have to, uh, once wars break, uh, you know, then it's very hard for us to begin uh, 
responding in terms of health care, including uh, mental health care. Uh, so we have to build the capacity for it. And the problem in uh, many of these places is uh, you're not going to get uh, any trained in a mental health professionals. Uh, so we have to really train uh, low level people. This is important for any health. You know, the same person who administers vaccination, uh, you know, or delivers anti-TB medications can also be trained to provide, you know, some uh, simple mental health interventions. And this can uh, make a big uh, difference. Uh, the third thing has to do with uh, uh, Mr. Gaskell alluded to uh, sensitizing uh, people, you know, obviously a lot of focus is uh, put on the mental health of uh, the soldiers, you know, which I think is important, uh, but we should also pay attention uh, to women and children, you know, in most of the times women are not the main combatant force, uh, but uh, they suffer inordinately and uh, not, you know, simply from the uncertainty and the bombings, but also uh, we all know that women and children get targeted for violence, and the violence becomes even more extreme when the soldiers view them as somebody not, you know, belonging to their group. And uh, so, uh, and so, we have to be sensitive uh, in making sure uh, we pay special attention to developing programs geared towards uh, women and children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, this that is really important. You talked about the need to organize, um, the need to 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 give opportunities to women for for leadership, and Ms. Gaskell also talked about the importance of having women reporting the stories and sharing the voices of other women because there 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 may be some additional connections there and some insights. Um, as well as can, I, can I interrupt for one minute? Yes, please, please. What you guys are doing makes the story more important as well. So um, Dr. Geyer was saying like uh, uh, about Syria and Yemen and how it's kind of fallen off the news cycle. It, it takes people like you, all of you to keep that on the news cycle somehow because it needs to stay. And, the, and, and she's, cor she's correct in saying Syria seems like they're suffering and, and I, I will, I'm sorry for interrupting, no, no, no. But, but we, as journalists, we need people like you to help us tell the story because otherwise the story can't be told. No, thank you. No, that is that is really important. And, and which which raise which um you bring um another important point. The the we don't often talk about um stories that are not necessarily in the battlefield, but what happens to women in isolation. So the violence and rape. The video um actually had a, a very powerful, like pointing and, and, and moved me where it says bullets, rape is less expensive than bullets. And that, you know, that that just was just so not not new, but just shocking and, and, and just painful to hear, right? So in isolation, Dr. Viss, you talked about, um, and Dr. Angari also the isolation that happens and, and the distancing, right? So if we can talk about that um, for, for a moment, um, raising awareness about the, the ongoing violence that's happening to women. I mean, we saw it during COVID, right? An escalation in, in, in violence, but also underreporting. So during times of conflict, can we can we talk about that and and, and raise awareness and discuss um, prevention or or um, empowerment is 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 key, as you said, Dr. This, but if we can have a discussion about that, please, because that's not something we often discuss. Yes, please, Dr. Geyer. Um, so one of the statistics that was shown in the video was actually from um, the International Rescue Committee where I worked. And, um, you know, in, in some of the villages in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, 75% of the women had been raped. I mean, this statistic is shocking, but in my experience, it's not abnormal and that's even more shocking. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot tell you, um, you know, I started working in conflict zones a very long time ago. Um, my first one was actually Sierra Leone during the war, um, all the way back then. And, you know, I'm going to cry, but, you know, I actually had to treat a woman who was, deliv who was delivering a baby um, and soldiers had actually damaged 
her during birth. <laughs> and of course, the baby had died. And, you know, it is a weapon of war. Um, we waste money on bullets, whereas you can, you can incite fear into a population by targeting the weakest of the population, of course, and that's women. And, you know, how a lot of, you know, in these sort of settings, women are so disempowered already, right? Financial disempowerment, cultural disempowerment, they're the last to get treatment. Um, I've been in lots of situations where, you know, they, the family only has enough um, finances to get, you know, to transport one person all the way to, to services. Um, they will choose the boy, not the woman or the girl. Um, but they will send the woman and the girl out to get water, um, to, to get the food for the family. Um, and the, your prime target, if you're in conflict zone, you've got soldiers running around, um, the fact that you're displaced, you're by yourself, um, you are prime target for, for rape and you are targeted in general anyway. And, and this is what is absolutely shocking. And we need to talk about this more um, because as, as we've heard the, the impact um, already on women and what they have to do. And then to, to, to have, have this happen and, and sometimes multiple times. Um, and I find it absolutely despicable um, that, you know, at the end of all of this, um, you know, women have to suffer um, in this way. So gender-based violence rape, it is absolutely a weapon of all. Um, you know, women don't want to necessarily report it because, um, you know, the stigma uh, for a start. Um, that's just the first of it. You know, so many women, are, and I mean, so when we say 75%, um, you know, that's through, you know, very excellent surveys, very, you know, confidential uh, ways of doing it. But but there'll be repercussions. Women are afraid, right? Um, so the the ability to actually, you know, help women is first to be able to know about it, to put in preventive services. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, this is the last thing that's thought about. People, you know, I was talking about healthcare services. Okay. Um, but it's not just at the hospital level. We need to work at a community level with the perpetrators as well to understand, well, this is wrong. This is, this is illegal. This is not right, right? And so the way to deal with this is um, not just sort of at a sort of technical level at the top, you know, trying to, to treat women's when, when we finally know about it and when, um, you know, they actually come to services, which may be never. Um, it's really about trying to, to, to stop it from the very beginning. Um, and that is really, really important. So the whole you know, un, uh, education um, and working with the perpetrators as well as women to, in, to try and build some safety around them. Um, I'll stop there because I know my other colleagues have a lot to say. Please, please. Other members of the panel, please. I, I, I personally, um, I have spent so many years covering veterans health, right? Me mental health, uh, U.S. veterans, but you talk about the soldiers and their mental health, and I feel like there is so, so little attention paid to women and children or even extended family. Let's think about a grandparent, right, or something, so, uh, an older uncle or someone like that. We don't talk about them. And look, I, I am married to a combat vet. I could tell you all day long about the VA. OK, I've, I've covered them for a decade or more, but there is so, so little that is talked about about women in conflict. And I'm not talking about women in combat. I said women in conflict. We don't rally around them and we should rally around our soldiers. Um, this is the United States of America. We owe a debt to every soldier who go, uh, you know, every, everyone who goes over there, right? You know, whatever, for whatever reason, whether it's a just war or an unjust war, or I don't know. But it does, um, Dr. Guy really, really speaks to my heart right now because they're just lost. 
imagine if there was like a VA for women in conflict. I mean, imagine that. I know it'll never happen, but imagine if there was a place that these women could go and just say, I am a victim of this war. And that's all I'll say, but, you know, we, we do, we, we need, we, we owe them so much, the, the children too, the children too. I mean, they got to grow up, you know, having their childhood be like this. So where is that sort of like VA mentality? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, where are those, where, where do we just put people, victims of war, and I don't look, I don't, I'm a journalist at heart. Don't ask me who would pay for it. <laughs> don't ask me where it would be. Don't ask me how it would happen. But like spiritually feeling about it, it's like they're the ones that just get left on the wayside, you know? And I'll, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Thank you for oh. letting me interrupt. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> but, where, but seriously, pandemic. where's their mental health? Yeah. Where's their PTSD? Where is their, all of it, you know, and, and it, and it's across the globe. This is not just Ukraine. It's, you know, and, and, and when Dr. Geyer spoke about Sierra Leone and, and Liberia, I mean, that these women, I mean, this is their life. Yeah. It's so hard. I mean, I, I spent so little time in war and it affected me greatly. No, I can't imagine. I can't imagine more than that. But but you also um, talked about children. Um, so we have a, a question um, in the chat that talks about um, video games and, and that depict war. Um, what so what is what how what does that do to children? So both children and, and um the long-term impact of children experiencing this, um adverse childhood experiences, as well as this this um games that depict conflicts. You know, what what does it do? Does it desensitize? Are you children? asking me? Oh, or, or um okay. yeah. I, you know, I mean war is not a may, war is may, not a video a game. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, actually, that's an important point. Uh, the, the thing is, unfortunately, many uh, people, you know, especially men, uh, grow up, uh, you, know, you know, most of the world with the idea that violence is all right, and especially mm -hmm. violence with, right. with women and uh, people are different from them are mm -hmm. all right. And so we have to really start, again, going back to prevention. Uh, I think uh, 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 in elementary schools, you know, the educational uh, process would uh, should start. Uh, I would. Uh, I don't know whether the UN has something like that, but probably the United Nations should come up with a curriculum, educational curriculum uh, for elementary school, and um, uh, which uh, uh, you know, those you know many countries can follow. Uh, for, for example, I think you know, but, uh, I have actually uh, read the children's books about. Uh, Madame Curie, and you know, like I think people have to be, you know, they're you know, fascinating, and Queen Victoria, and you know, there are a lot of some of the books are already available. I think you know we have to in our elementary school curriculum, uh, we have to show you know people should learn both the boys and girls should learn about uh, women uh, scientists, women artists, you know, women leaders uh, are people who provided a lot of service. This would help them to uh, respect the women and. Uh, uh, really treat them with a dignity. No, no, thank you. And and the um, the question from the chat also goes on to talk about um, desensitizing that. What these what it does is it it really desensitizes um, and doesn't allow children to really understand the impact and and the severity of, of war. That as as Ms. Gaspel said, war is not a video game. It is not a game. Um, another question from from the chat is um, so long-term impact on on children um the we we talked about or mentioned um adverse um childhood experiences and and so the long-term the, the post-traumatic stress so what what um can can we discuss that oh uh, yeah, yeah I, I partly you know just going back to the previous question you know there's a lot of literature showing uh that uh, video violent video games foster violence, and so obviously at policy level, you know, uh, people have to uh, influence, you know, the violence shown uh, in these things. 
And in terms of the long-term impact, and obviously the earlier the trauma happens, you know, the worse, uh, uh, the earlier at age, you know, in development, the, the trauma happens, uh, the worse uh, uh, the outcome is, you know, it's harder to treat, uh, especially uh, if uh, trauma is experienced when uh, children have not uh, developed language skills. Later on, you know, all those uh, traumatic experiences, they cannot even uh, verbalize it. And also at the time which happens, you know, they cannot verbalize it and get any needed uh, support. And uh, so um, uh, also it goes without saying uh, that anybody we see, especially in mental health, we, we, you know, we always screen them for the childhood uh, traumatic experiences, you know, because many people will not talk about it unless you ask them specifically about it. No, I have to jump in. I'm so sorry. But war wars are started by global leaders. They are not started by children who play video games. They are started by economic and uh, power and global issues. And I, I just I take issue with this a little bit right now because you can talk about kids who play video games, but it is the adults in the room who start these wars. It is not kids playing video games. And yeah, maybe they join the army for that reason. Maybe they want to fight for that reason. I get that. But do not tell me that kids playing video games start wars. Uh, no, I, I had in mind. Actually. No, I'm not talking to you, yeah, sir. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're awesome. I'm just saying. Our global leaders are the yeah. ones who are doing this to us. No. No, thank to you. To our families. Yes. To our families. Yeah, to our My family. husband's a veteran. Absolutely. To these kids in Ukraine. This is not like some like a bunch of kid, you know, young guys want to start a global war. These are our leaders. We need to pay attention to our news. We need to vote. We need to get good people in and out of office. Blah, blah, blah. I know I'm talking about the journalist no. aspect here, but it, it, I, and I and I think your question is 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 fair. Mm -hmm. um, like if you ask my husband why he joined the army, it wasn't because of video games. It was because of 9-11. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like he was like, I got to fight for my country. I'm a, I'm a big grown man. I'm going to fight. But I, I, I get that like men are different than women. And I think that was your point. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, you know, we, most women don't play like uh, Grand Theft Auto, you know, but let's be very, very clear in this conversation that these are our global leaders Wrong. starting these wars. Absolutely. And I, I'm going to take a breath. No, no, absolutely. And I think <laughs> because like, like, yeah, no, the, you the, know, the, like they're starting yeah. this, they're playing yeah. it and we're all the victims, all yeah. of us. No, I agree. No, thank you for sharing that. And, and I think what the, the question in the chat was, the impact that it has on children, not necessarily that children um, are starting this, but what impact does it have? As, as well, what's the impact of, of, of a bunch of um, uh, rockets falling on you yeah. as a child? That's the question that needs to be asked. Is not a video game. It's when you grow up in a war zone, you you your life is very different than than it. Yeah. Did they even I, have? I, I, I'll stop. Uh, please, no, that was that please was chime question. in. That was a question from the <laughs> chat. Um, so we do welcome questions from the chat because it does generate discussion. So yeah. um, I, I do recognize that the, the, the person in the chat was asking about the overall impact of, of children. So I thank you for posting this question in the chat and thank you so much for your response. Um, so now let's, let, let's talk about um, experiences of our journalists, our physicians in the field. So we have another question from the chat that says, um, I see how all of you, are affected by what you've seen, what you've experienced, um, the people you've cared for. So how do you balance your um, ability um, to, to, to share the story, but, is, um, but at the same time maintain your focus and um, emotional health? So this, this, this is um, your ability to, to do your work wonderfully, um, but at the same time, you know, we, we saw how moving and emotional this discussion is, um, how, the balance. So this is what the um, the audience member would like to know. More like a, a you know, work life versus home life balance kind of idea. Is that is that what we're looking for? Um, you know, how you... Or I mean, the above, really, really. Yeah, I think for me, a lot of the time is, you know, I actually take a lot of time if I can to listen to my patients and their stories, because I was always the type of person who uh, I feel like learned 
uh, mm -hmm. from other people, from other people's experiences. Um, and I think that there's so much value in that. Um, yes, it can be very overwhelming, especially with a lot of emotions. And I, I do find, you know, that even here, even, you know, not in a warlike setting, you know, our patients go through a, a lot, a lot. Um, but um, I think it helps us grow. I think it gives us introspection. It allows me to think about my life and, you know, where I am at and the privileges that I have and wow, the things that, you know, people go through. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, when I go home uh, to my fiance, I, uh, you know, I take a deep breath out. I'm not going to lie. And yeah. um, I'm just so grateful, you know, that I found someone and that, you know, uh, you know, cares for me and um, that I have people around me that I love and that I'm not in an area of war, even though there is plenty of war like things that do exist here, um, not in an actual war. And um, it's not it's not easy. It's not easy because, uh, you know, you, you're very much affected by how people feel. I mean, that's why most of us become doctors, right? Because we care about people. So we're very much affected by that. Um, you know, um, and it's very difficult to separate that, but it is important to surround yourself with, you know, people you love and a, and a, a way to take a little bit of a break from all that and a moment to kind of let it, you know, sit in there and, and think about like, you know, the impact and the impact that you have as a physician. Yeah, you know, I echo that, you know, all health professionals, uh, they, you know, uh, uh, have to be empathic and at the same time uh, still keep the cool to take care of the problem, you know, like uh, delivering the baby, you cannot be emotionally distraught, while at the same time you do feel for what the person is going through. And actually, I have to really admire people who are actually delivering the babies while the bombs are falling, you know, like <laughs> really, that's to me, really, uh, it's really hats off to them for their ability to do that, as the video showed. You know, it's uh, wonderful healthcare workers. Thank you. I think one of the things um, for me is, um, you know, being kind to others is incredibly rewarding. I mean, that's what humanity is about. And so when you are working in, in these situations, um, you know, I, I look at what's going on and I think, wow, the suffering that people are going through, you know, we are all born so unequal. <laughs> it's the fact that you were born in Yemen and I was born somewhere else. Um, it's not, it's chance, right? And what happens in your life, you can control a lot. There are a lot of things you can't control. And, and, and you see, uh, you know, you saw in the video, um, the resilience of people, um, you know, Dr. Burton Foster was mentioning that uh, there's this, people are still positive despite the fact they've lost everything. And for me, that alone spurs me on. Like it, it's, it's, if they are going through this, I'm doing my job. Right. And, and that mentally is, is so stimulating and rewarding. Um, and, and I think, you know, doing something for your fellow human being um, is, is no greater sort of reward. And, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. I think um, at the same time, um, it's really important to be emotional, right? You don't hold everything back, you know, um, and I still, you know, have a tear for, for some of the things that I saw like 20 years ago because you can't lose connection and that's your connection with, you know, your fellow human being is that you you need to make sure that you aren't a robot. Of course, you've got to continue your work, you, you, but you are also letting your emotions out at the end of the day. You talk to people. Um, I've I've cried with my patients um, when uh, there have been losses uh, uh, and telling them, you know, this is what's happened. Um, and I've been bawling my eyes out with them. And uh, that's part of your release. It's part of them understanding that you are actually also a human being and you care. And I think um, that is one of the most important things to be able to show your kindness, do your work, but show your empathy as well. And, and that is also something that helps you as an individual um, to continue. I think we also have to understand that we are an outlet sometimes. You know, there's sometimes that your patients have no one to speak to. I have some patients come in that don't even need GYN care. They just come in because they need someone to speak to. And when they don't come in, I get concerned. I'm worried. I'm like, whoa, this patient is usually here. <laughs> 
you know, what's going on. And you see that all the time. So, you know, we are an, an outlet and it's very important that, you know, we're aware of that. Uh, yeah, actually, f- following okay. along, that's an <laughs> important uh, point. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, you know, like um, uh, often uh, people, you know, do not directly seek mental health help, uh, mm-hmm. but when they come in for some other medical help, that gives an entree. Like uh, one example of that is uh, after the uh, Haitian earthquake, uh, there was obviously mm-hmm. tremendous need uh, in our Haitian community in uh, Brooklyn. You know, many people lost their closer relatives. Uh, so what we did was we went to the churches and uh, we basically offered to measure their uh, blood pressure. And uh, b- b- many people came for that. But in the process, we also would screen them for uh, depression. And uh, then, you know, if they agree to it, you know, then we refer them to our clinic uh, so for further follow-up. If we had just gone there as a depression screening, I'm sure we wouldn't have had uh, that many people show up. So that's important. Much wanna, of the mental health care is uh, delivered in primary care settings. You guys are so amazing. I have to say, if I may, um, when I was asked to get on this panel with all of you distinguished medical people, I was like, well, I don't deserve this. Um, I want to tell you a, a, a really weird story, and I think you'll all appreciate it. When I arrived in Mosul in 2007, the height of the war, and um, uh, these U.S. I was with these U.S. soldiers. They were getting shot at, and one of the guys, the bad guys from Al Qaeda, right? He got shot too, and his hand was completely blown off. Mm-hmm. And I remember going into the um, medical tent, and um, the doctor came in. He was exhausted. And he came in and he said, and you know, Geneva conventions, you're going to help him. Right. And he said, what he said to the interpreter, what hand is he, is he right-handed or left-handed? He was right-handed, but his left hand was blown off and the doctor started screaming. He was just like, God, Blah, 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 blah. because here he's going to fix up this guy who's going to go back out with his right hand and shoot at you as soldiers again. He was m- mentally upset, but he stitched him up, put him back, and he went back on the battlefield. And that was when I kind of saw the mental toll it took on you guys to treat people in a war zone, not just the women and children, but, you know, uh, just everybody who knows who they are. Right. And back then we didn't know who was who they didn't fight in uniforms. They didn't show up with a uniform. You know, they all spoke the same language. And I just sat there and I thought, this is crazy. You guys are, you guys take so much on so much on when you're working with any type of people who, who've been affected by a war zone. And then, you know, I've dealt with the VA for so many years, even with my husband personally. And, you know, there are days I want to just scream at them. And then there are days when I'm, I realize they've seen like 18 patients in like two hours, you know, like it's not enough. And I don't know how we can get through to the American people or to the global people that we need more help. We need more help. We need help for the women, the children, the victims, the rape victims, the women who are pregnant in the war zone, the veterans, and the veterans are, you know, I mean, you even look at these Russian POWs who are being held right now. These guys are messed up. (laughs) I'm not advocating for them, but I'm just saying like, what war does so much to a person? I I have experienced this like full circle of what war does to any person who's involved in it. And it just blows my mind that we can't fix this. And I know that war will never stop, but like, I, I, you know, I I just, I, I, I commend each and every one of you for everything you're doing and please keep talking to the press. That's the only way to get these stories out is, is just, get them out. And, and I, I'm just so grateful to be, uh, I'm honored to be among this panel with you guys. I really am. Well, we thank, um, we, we thank all of you for joining us and we're almost at the end of our session. Um, any last comments or anything that any um, panelists wanted to share, Dr. Geyer? 
Yeah, I just like to um, come back on the long term impact on children. Um, I think you know we talked about stress and and things like that, but um, it's evidence has shown that early childhood development. Um, the the nurture that mothers provide, the care, like even before you start school, is extremely important for cognitive development, right? So whether it's weeks, months, and then certainly years of sort of trauma um, and mothers not being able to provide that sort of stimulation and the and the nurture and the care that children need to grow their brains has a huge, so we already talked about, you know, the basic impact on not accessing healthcare or vaccines, et cetera. This is just on a different scale. And I want people to understand, um, your viewers, that we could be like changing generations, right, now, as we have already in Syria and Yemen and other countries, because, you know, one year is one year of a child's life. Going from two to three is a big deal. Going from three to four is a big deal. Going from three to eight with limited nurture and care. And then we talk about schooling, right? Schooling is disrupted. Um, so basic numeracy, literacy, uh, schooling is disrupted. The teachers, there's a brain drain in every service, right? Not just medical, um, it's the teachers as well. So I just wanted to sort of say that, you know, um, there are the short-term consequences, medium-term, but then we're also talking about long-term development. We talk, you know, uh, not to belittle this, uh, but, you know, economies depend on, you know, people doing their jobs, working, et cetera. Um, so, you know, these leaders that are fighting and doing these sorts of things, you know, you're not just, like, trying to win over pieces of land. You're, like, destroying generations. And it starts with the kids. And, and that, for me, is just, you know, heartbreaking. Women and children are the ones that are, you know, building communities and families. And conflict is just pulling everything down and destroying futures. And, and we need to absolutely, you know, talk about this more and do, do more and, and finance it more. And we have to do it early and continuously and not forget about all, the, all these situations that are happening. Um, well said. I also want to extend appreciation to the war correspondents like uh, Miss Gaskell. You know, you praise us, but we have to. We have a lot of praise for you too, uh, because if you do not report on these atrocities, the world would never know about you know uh, all you know these difficult situations. You know how many women are raped and uh, children die, and the provision of medical care. You know the doctors may do it excellent job but if you don't report on it you know the rest of the world wouldn't find out about it and you are really doing it uh, at extreme risk to yourself you know that's really a selfless service and so thank you very much thank you so you're 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 new yeah that, that that means the world to me and um i did uh, give up a part of my life to do that because it was important and it's, I'm trying not to go to Ukraine right now because I do want to and I have a lot of friends over there but like I said before you guys are the meat of what we do like you have to talk to journalists you have to tell them what's going on so that they can effectively tell the you know the the public what's going on and I'm not I'm not sitting here saying we're the best you know the, I, we can have a whole nother conversation about the media they're not the best, but if you keep telling the world what's happening and what your thoughts are, then you'll find the right reporter who gives the right story, who does the right thing. And um, I, 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 I don't know why I went over there, but it, it changed my life. And um, and I know it's changed you guys' life. I can hear it in your voices of of, of what you do is meaningful and. And same for me. And like I said, I'm humbled. I'm humbled. But um, yeah, thank you so much, doctor, for saying that. Um, thank you. Thank you. And we have one more question that just came my way um, from the chat. The occurrence of rape and war is unfortunately often seen as just a thing. And it, that happens um, rather than the deliberate strategy. 
that it is the you know we talked about weapon a weapon it's a how, weapon how do how do we change that how do we <laughs> how do we change this thinking it's a weapon of war. You, my husband is a big um, uh, historian of war. And I, I'm sorry to say this, but um, it is a weapon. It's the same as a gun. It's the same as a bomb. It's the same as anything. One of the first things they do is they wipe all that out. It is. It, everyone needs to understand that it is a weapon. It's not a bunch of, uh, I, I don't want to speak too much about it, but it is a weapon of war. You rape and pillage, and then you take over the land, and then I'll stop with that. But it is a weapon. It's a weapon. And it's not some sexual type of thing it is a weapon of war kill all the women and children the w- men go off to fight you can read about it in shakespeare times mm-hmm. i mean come on it's it's about breaking the spirit it, and it's about it's about changing the population right you know these women some of them will get pregnant and they will not be right so we have to think about that i don't think that that's unfortunately ever going to change when you're dealing with war and i agree with you Absolutely. A weapon. Well, thank you again. Dr. Um, Dean Demise, did you want to um, offer final comments? You're on mute, sir. It's fascinating to hear the experiences of the panelists, but I completely agree. The intention of rape is not just a sexual thing, but to really damage the woman in the generation, actually, psychologically, physically, and, uh, you know, to use it as a weapon. I I completely agree with the panelists. It's it's not just for the sake of uh, the uh, sexually-related things, but as a weapon. And that has been really true uh, in northern Ethiopia, within the last two, three weeks, three months, uh, a lot of women uh, were subjected to sexual violence, rape, and uh, not only they also encapsulate them, and they will not uh, give them access to food and to basic healthcare needs. You know, it's uh, a way of putting pressure on the, on the population, putting pressure on the uh, parties that are fighting against them. So it, it is a different strategy than really using it uh, for other purposes. It is just as a weapon. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules across time zones to join us and to really share in a um, difficult conversation, but one that we have to have and that has to continue. Um, thank you so much for Dawn <laughs> in her office um, for, for really convening this, 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 this group of, of dynamic individuals. Um, and we shouldn't stop this conversation. We definitely have to continue it um, so we can raise awareness, continue, continue, continue to, um, to, to use our platform. So thank you to our audience for joining and for putting your questions um, in the chat. And um, thank you to all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you, fellow panelists. You know, it's a wonderful discussion. And again, thank uh, Mr. Don Skitwalker for arranging this. Thank you. Thank you. Really good discussion. Thank you, guys. Pleasure thank to meet you all. Pleasure to meet you. Also. Um, Likewise, because yeah, this affects communities. I, you know, my my brother um, has been in Iraq and Afghanistan, and and yeah, I'm surprised I didn't cry. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for all the work you guys do. It's so meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. you.